Welcome to Being in Practice. I'm Erin Davis. I use they, them pronouns. I'm a therapist. I'm Danny Dwyer Willingham. I use they, she pronouns, and I'm a quantum somatic coach. And we're a couple of queer, neurodivergent, multi-passionates here to get curious and unpack elements of collective and individual experiences through our intuitive, trauma-informed lenses. We're both practitioners and people in our own constant discovery, here to provide education, entertainment, and exploration on the practice of being as messy and as multidimensional as it can be. Let's Let's be be in in practice practice together. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Being in Practice. This is co-host Danny, just letting everyone know at the very beginning that this is a podcast in which Erin and I will be discussing more sensitive topics like complex trauma, abuse dynamics, disordered eating, religious trauma and indoctrination, and other topics that might be considered more triggering depending on where you're at in your journey. If this is not the time for you to embrace these topics with us. We absolutely understand and we invite you to come back at any other time when you do feel ready. If you are ready to join us, welcome. We promise to navigate these topics with as much care, safety, and tenderness as we possibly can as trauma-informed experts and professionals. And we are so excited to have you here with us exploring the messy and multidimensional ways of being that we get to dive into this season and beyond on Being in Practice. Welcome. We're so glad you're here. Hi, everyone. Hi, everybody. We're back. Yeah. Welcome back to Being in Practice, the podcast. I'm Erin. And I'm Danny. We're so glad to be here. Yeah. Kind of unfolding what this season of our podcast will actually be. Last time you got our intro, if you haven't listened, go back and listen to the story of how Erin and I met mm-hmm. and a little bit more about who we are and how we practice and um, yeah, kind of the foundational element for how Erin and I work together. Mm-hmm. Um, el- did I say element? I meant episode, but both. Yeah. I all of the above. I didn't catch that. Um, and so now we're going to be starting to unfold what the actual content of this podcast will be. Yes. Yes. Which is for this season, we're focusing around collective experiences. Um, well said. Yeah, that most of us can identify with. Mm-hmm. Would you like to give the intro of the topic? Yeah, today. Day? Yes, yes. Today we are focusing on authenticity um, and along with authenticity. And I think this will be true for a lot of the episodes. There's always right the other side of things. So we're going to be going over healing from repression and how we get to authenticity. Mm -hmm. And you and I are going to be talking about this in our own lives, going over what, what we think each of these things means and how we kind of got into our authentic selves. Yes. And I would say how we always continue to become our authentic selves. And I think how we grapple with how repression continues to show up even after so much of a quote unquote healing journey. Yes. So do we want to start with Mm. kind of a brief outline of what this episode will cover? Yeah. Yeah. We're going to go over understanding what repression is, the impact that it has on all of us journeying towards authenticity, Mm -hmm. like you just said. So maybe where we've come from, but also how it's still active, active in our lives. Yes. And we're going to get into, obviously, examples of that. And then at the end, we're going to have some resources for people Mm -hmm. to tap that, (laughs) (laughs) to keep getting into authenticity for themselves. Tap that authenticity, baby. I just think it's, yeah, I mean, I think this, I'm really excited for this episode for this topic because I think it's played, authenticity feels like a major value Mm -hmm. in my, like, throughout my life to me. Mm -hmm. So it's really cool we're starting. Well kind of starting with this. I feel like it's one of those things that for me, I remember being like, what does it even mean to be my authentic self? Mm. What does authenticity mean? Do, is that actual baloney? Like, does that app even exist? You questioned that? Absolutely. I was you like, questioned if there was an authentic you? I questioned if authenticity was even real. I like, I'm like, I think everyone's just walking around Whoa. Bullshitting their way through life. Really? I I used to think that. (laughs) Okay. I mean, I guess I could see that 
play out a little bit if I look back to like high school, college mm -hmm. age, mm -hmm. where it feels like everyone's just, I remember thinking everyone's just faking it. I feel like yeah. I had a similar thought. Totally. But I don't remember questioning if authenticity was real because mm -hmm. I've always felt, I, whether true or not, like who knows, but like many times. I always felt like I was very much on in my authenticity, mostly at all times. Mm. Ooh, I did not. We've talked about this. Yes, we have. Which we can keep getting Which into. you can hear about in episode one a little bit, but also outside of recording, we've talked about it. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I feel like, and again, kind of having come to this understanding that repression influences the levels at which we can show up authentically in the world. Mm -hmm. Because, okay, I guess this would be maybe a good time to introduce a broad definition of what repression is in case any of our, any of our audience um, doesn't really understand. So would you like to share kind of the more psychological definition? Yes. Our therapist friend over here. Yes, the therapist. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, I did chat to me this definition, but I agree with it. Um, we'll get it. Okay, I'll just read it off so that we can have a uh, working model for all of us. Yeah. Repression is the psychological defense mechanism that occurs when a person unconsciously pushes away or blocks out certain thoughts, feelings, or memories that are considered unacceptable or painful. Mm -hmm. So when it says, goes on, when someone lives in repression, they might be unaware of the thoughts and feelings they're pushing away and may struggle to express themselves authentically or connect with others in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good, that gives us a good framework to work yeah. with. Um, so when we block out things, thoughts, feelings, memories that are unacceptable or painful. Um, and I think the key, the second sentence, which I'm really glad chat GPT put in here, cause I would have said it if it didn't, <laughs> is that sometimes, and maybe even a lot of times we're not aware that we're doing the blocking. Oh yeah. It's an unconscious, a lot of times until it isn't, it's an unconscious process. Right because it's a defense mechanism and we mm -hmm. all have defense mechanisms. I also like at the end here, which I'll just say, um, this is normal. Mm -hmm. Repression is normal. Defense yes. mechanisms are a part of being human. It's a part of survival. Also for of those survival. of us who have survived abuse mm -hmm. in many, in any form to repress mm -hmm. is to survive in many cases. Yeah. So also being like very gentle with ourselves around yes. that, like we have made it here because of our defense mechanisms. A lot of the times and our coping strategies have gotten us to where we are and we get to decide if they're serving us anymore or not. And that's when we have the option to start changing them because if we're ready to like untangle from the things that feel repressive to us, that's when we can start healing those elements we can be working towards our authentic true selves i feel like the whole time and also like the ways in which healing becomes accessible to us changes at the times in our lives that you know are influenced by so many factors yes there's yes. not one way <laughs> i think what you're saying or what i took away from what you just said is there's not one way to like be authentic and how we reach mm -hmm. authenticity or healing mm -hmm. which i equate those two words and i think that's kind of how you're using them, but I equate those two words are synonyms to me. Like living authentically is, is healing yeah. once we can realize that. So how we come to see repression in our own lives and where we're repressing certain behaviors or memories or whatever, um, it's going to look different how we access, make that conscious mm -hmm. and then move forward in authenticity. Yeah. That's going to look different at all times. And it's also not a timeline. Like the the saying i don't know who came up with it but the saying saying that like healing is not linear it's so true i feel like it's taken me in my own personal journey over 12 years in therapy and like many other healing modalities now to unravel different parts of myself at different times and those all opened up different aspects of like what i'd been holding that was repression and what I could then move into like, that was more myself, but it's all been such a jumble and it's taken time. This work takes so much time and we don't want to give ourselves time. I wish it was Do linear. We? Oh, so many times I wish it was linear. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So how do you feel like, I mean, I just want to ask, I guess, mm -hmm. with that, like with our differences coming to the table with maybe even experiences of repression, I definitely have experiences of repression. So when I mm -hmm. say that looking back and you, you feeling like you didn't believe authenticity was 
maybe even a real attainable true thing uh-huh. or even maybe a thing at all. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I still, and I'm thinking it's a thing and feeling authentic. That doesn't mean I didn't have repression because I totally did. But I guess I'm curious for you, um, like how, how does that look looking back now that you think that there's authenticity mm. or you know that there's authenticity or you feel more authentic, like knowing that like was repression, like not believing in authenticity repression or like, how were you repressed? I think, I mean, I was repressed in almost every single way <laughs> and I'll get into what a little bit of that is. Do you I feel like that feeds into not believing authenticity is a I thing? I do because yeah. I was so uncertain of who I was and I was so like the reflective world around me was proof that people were lying to me all the time or like mm. using me or mm -hmm. like there was always like an ulterior motive. So to me, that meant that no one could actually be like true I or see. authentic mm -hmm. because again, like the world that I experienced were, was lying, deceit, mm -hmm. abuse, all of the things that totally. told me that, that makes sense. nothing was real. And certainly people, these weren't, these people weren't being their true selves because they were causing me harm. Hmm. Yeah. So I think it was a combination of my repression and also the world around me telling me that like, it wasn't a safe place mm -hmm. to be. Mm -hmm. Totally. You know? That if authenticity was, was a thing. If this is what authenticity is. Yeah. To do it. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like, well, put that in the back stash and just like, yeah, it's not real. But and you here, were, and here we are, <laughs> you know, and, and just to reference a conversation we had before we started recording, but like you were, you were talking about the impact repression has had on your emotional and mental well-being. Oh yeah. So I, I mean, think you referenced that a little bit ago too, but yes, kind of going into the more personal story. I mean, I was raised in a very religious home where I was, you know, told that who I was, wasn't, mm, like was sinning or whatever. Mm -hmm. I also was a neurodivergent kid living in a perfectionist world. Like I was conditioned. I even remember like I had fully dissociated by the time I was seven from life. I don't remember most of my childhood consciously. Mm -hmm. I can mm -hmm. access memories now when I choose to, but I realized that by the time I was seven, I was so dissociated because I was so disconnected from like my thoughts, my feelings, my emotions that I basically went through most of my childhood. Um, yeah, not in my body, hmm. which is wild to that think about. Wild. Yeah. That and then so I started wild. working so young at 14. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so for me, the ways that repression then showed up in my life were like, I made choices from a dissociated, dysregulated state and my life reflected that through mm -hmm. drug use, through numbing, through mm -hmm. all sorts of coping mechanisms that I coasted through life with. I honestly don't know how I survived, but I'm, I'm glad that I did now. Yeah. Yes. And then it turned into like hyper seeking safety. How can I feel safe in this world that has shown me how unsafe it is? Mm -hmm. Totally. And that turned into me repressing my own queerness marrying a cishet man straight man for those mm -hmm. i don't think you're listening to this if you don't know what cishet means but you know just to clarify <laughs> um married a straight man had a child even before i had my kid um really dealt with my first severe uh depressive episode and then after I had my child. Oh, and I was also then diagnosed with ADHD and dyscalculia, like a bunch of like mm -hmm. learning disabilities that I never knew that I had mm -hmm. and always felt so guilty that like I couldn't do things the way other people did. Totally. So there was all of that. Yeah. I also have an invisible disability and had been told my whole life that because of the way that I looked, I should be able to like do anything physically and had literally repressed my own feelings when I realized that I was in more pain every day than most people experience mm. like categorically I broke down understanding that like oh. I had told myself I couldn't feel pain so I just pushed through and my body more repression broke because of it yeah absolute repression like mm. ugh, 
So well, and that's such a defense mechanism too. It just comes back to that. Like yeah. that probably did protect you yeah. from a lot of things for a little while. But I, in the work that I did, like I would, I mean, I, tra- I traveled, I was on five to seven planes a week mm-hmm. and exhausted and on my feet all day on the body. And the ways that I coped were drugs and drinking mm-hmm. because I was in so much pain. Some days I couldn't stand, but I had to. That's so tough. Or I couldn't sleep, but I had to. Yeah. And I did what I needed to do to do those things for a decade. Wow. So anyways, fast, fasting, fast forwarding, (laughs) fasting forward. (laughs) Um, Yeah. So my life then became a reflection of my repression. Looking around, I like owned a home, had a husband, had a baby, but security, security, I had quote unquote safety. Mm -hmm. But my, my dissociation was at an all-time high. I experienced, like, derealization, depersonalization wow. for the first time. Hmm. Intense panic attacks. Massive depression. This is all while trying to raise a baby. Wow. And um, literally was like, this isn't my life. Like, wow. I can't be here anymore. That's a really... That's what repression did for me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad that you shared that. And I appreciate you sharing with all of us, me included. Um, But I think it is, it paints a really useful picture for our listeners and myself on what repression, like, right. That's like maybe a more extreme example, maybe not for some of our listeners, but there's like a lot in there and it, it got to the point where you didn't even feel like you were living your life. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's. Yeah. And I will say, and I said, I think that's so common though. Yeah. I think so. so, I mean, and that's why I think we do the work that we do because Mm -hmm. I've realized also like all of that repression has been stored in my body until I've like released it, which is why I do somatic work because that is like an energy work because like energetically identifying where things live and then being able to like somatically and emotionally release Mm -hmm. those things has like helped me like uncover a freedom I never knew was possible for myself. And again, that's the work that I get to do with people. But it took me, and this isn't necessary for everyone, or maybe it is, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But the path that I took was realizing that like my health had gotten to such an extreme negative place, my mental health, my physical health. um, I literally broke my foot and that was kind of the last, I literally couldn't walk. I was like, I am no longer moving forward. That's when I realized that I had to change everything. That's when I, my husband and I separated. Interesting. And as soon as I, I mean, not as soon as it took a while, Mm -hmm. but moving through my separation and divorce, um, I will also preface this by saying like the man that I divorced was like, he's a great person. He's my father's kid. We co-parent together. Like we'll always be so grateful for him, but like, it just wasn't my, it wasn't for me. It wasn't me living my truth. Um, and in the two years since then, I've been able to almost fully heal all of my mental health symptoms Mm -hmm. and that's great and i'm living in less chronic pain and have had less like somatic harmful or like painful somatic expression than ever in my entire life that's so incredible so in healing repression i've also felt my mental health and my physical health recuperate as well well and i think to be you know on theme Mm -hmm. to be to step into your authenticity, you know, freed you to, to be more healthy, to feel better in mm-hmm. your body, to like do those things. Yeah. And it's been systemic. Like healing it's been systemic and ecological. Is, is maybe equal to yes. like, right. It's the other side of. Yeah. Which is again, the work that I do is like, you've got to take, I had to take a snapshot of my whole life, figuring out what was serving me, what was not serving me figuring out what I wanted to keep and like disentangling from all of the conditioning that I had, then figuring out what my true values were and then like creating a life from that place because a life that reflected my repression, my disalignment from my values was not serving me any longer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I had the privilege to be able to like go out on my own. I know a lot of people don't feel like they can do that, you know, totally. So and like, wow. yeah, single parenting, not easy, y'all, but worth has been so worth it for me and my family. Yeah, totally. Yeah. 
I have so many thoughts about this. It's so <laughs> like so many like connections to this topic, obviously, because you're talking about it, but just like where we could go mm -hmm. just with like, I think about how it's a defense, right? Like you did that as a defense mechanism. Mm -hmm. We do things. Un it's mostly unconscious, like our little definition set of repression to protect ourselves. And then those same things that are protecting us end up causing us harm or pain yes. Yes. Um, because we outgrow them because mm -hmm. they're no longer they're doing the wrong job, but they don't know it. Like exactly. we're protectors. And it's, it's like, thank you, brain. Yes, thank you for exactly. keeping me safe and keeping me alive. And also like, we've got to change some neural pathways over here mm -hmm. <laughs> and some somatic activations that happen. Yeah. So, yeah. And it's also, and then I go into the thought, cause I, I feel like I've experienced this in my life and I've seen people in my life, peers and friends who I've seen I've seen like come out later in life and, and it, the buildup and it's similar to your buildup where, right. There's a buildup of pain or mm -hmm. challenge or however you want to put it, whether that's in the body or in our environment, all of the above where it comes to a boiling point and then we have to change or we don't have to, I suppose, but there's going to continue to be hardship until we do almost, it feels Absolutely. like. I don't know if that's like your experience or how you would maybe put it, but I think when we, the unconscious, almost it's like it has to become, at least in my experience in my life and what I've seen in a lot of my friends' life, the unconscious almost has to become conscious or begs to become conscious mm -hmm. through those pains. Well, that's the thing through somatic symptoms, through mental mm -hmm. health symptoms, through, I feel like our bodies are, our bodies and our brains are screaming at us to pay attention. But as a society, we're conditioned not to do that. Yes. What is that conditioning though? <laughs> like, I don't disagree, but I actually don't know what, like, I feel like with a lot of conditioning, I might be able to not logic away, mm -hmm. explain or mm -hmm. something, right? Understand, but I don't know what this would be from. Are you, is the question like, what is the conditioning that tells us we need to separate from our feelings? Yes, and our yes, I guess okay. I mean, it's I would so say, interesting. Like, I as, agree. As a parent of a young child, mm -hmm. I see this in a lot of newer conscious, quote unquote, parenting mm -hmm. in actually in like a really healthy way, realizing that most of us were raised by people who were doing the best that they could. Mm -hmm. And we're also typically saying, it's okay, don't cry, mm. stop crying, here's a toy. Every time that happens in a ch to a child and to a child's brain, it's telling them to not believe themselves, to not believe their feelings. And again, by, for me, it was when I was seven, like by the time I had, I became seven, I had been told those things mm -hmm. so many times, mm -hmm. don't do it that way your way is not right. Things that I saw and shared were told that they were not true. Like all of that gaslighting as a young child becomes dissociation from our bodies, from our, our emotions mm -hmm. and our feelings. And I was not raised in a house where like genuine feelings were able to be processed in safe and healthy ways. Um, there was a lot of punishment and a lot of totally physical, yeah. like correction for. Yeah sharing who I, like what my actual childhood experiences were. Totally. And so even for people that maybe have different childhood experiences yeah. or, or family system mm -hmm. stuff, mm -hmm. the conditioning is still around us because I mean, adults, all adults are all adults in a child's life, teacher, coach. I mean, they're, they're, they're going to have an impact on. Yeah their psyche. <laughs> Most of us are told to like so, hug adults. We don't yeah, necessarily, yeah, yeah. we didn't necessarily. So now like consent based parenting, yeah, totally. you know, like connection and attunement based parenting, those are kind of like changing the ways in which kids can access. Mm -hmm. And also like, yeah, we've still, I've still got a long way to go and like doing that for myself so I can continue doing that for my kid. But I think there's a lot of us adults walking around who are just like, have a lot of those things in our bodies and yeah, maybe they're not serving us anymore. You know? Yeah. Did that answer the question? Was that like, I think so. I think, is? I think so. Yeah. I think also again, as like female bodied people, mm -hmm. I was certainly not taught to like love my body or believe my body. 
from like magazines and things at a very young age. It just sounds like the sil- like the simplest thing when we yeah. talk about it, mm. that it's like, why are we, it's just unconscious, right? And that's yeah. the answer to why and why is not always the most important question, but it's yeah. just so fascinating, right? Like, like saying like, listen to your body, like <laughs> it's, but it, in practice out in the field, right? In living life. Yeah. In the moment. With children, moment. especially yeah. as a parent, I'm thinking about that, like out in the field when I've worked with kids a lot, mm-hmm. like it's su- that's such a radical practice, mm-hmm. not state. I think we would all agree. Yeah. Like we should all listen. Kids should like their, what they think of their bodies, how they're experiencing something mm-hmm. in their bodies, all valid. Like I would hope we would all agree with that statement, but in practice, it's like out there in the field, that's a whole different ball game. Yeah. And it's so hard. It's and a- it's so radical. That's like a radical practice. But I think this is the full circle of like healing from repression is radical. I love to it. To break yeah. outside of the conditioning and the like everything that I will say everything, but like that humans as a whole have been taught to believe are true, to question those things, to commit to living our own truths instead of the truths that other people prescribe for us. That is radical. I agree. That is the radical work. And it's the hard work. It's the hard work, y'all. Yes, it (laughs) is hard hard work. I would say (laughs) I had a, actually my, uh, the people that I do have done, um, ayahuasca ceremonies with it. Mm -hmm. One of the, one of the leaders, he always said, it's simple, not easy. And I love, Mm. love, love that saying. Yeah. Because I don't think it's complicated but it is not easy. I think it's complex. I do think it's nuanced, sure. especially for people who are living multifaceted, reflective versions of their life. <laughs> Did that well, I think that's sense? the not easy part, right? Yes, like, it's simple. Exactly. The concept of listen to your body. Right. It's a simple concept, but mm-hmm. then, in, but it then takes the, time. It, the hardness yeah. is where what you just said, right? It's complex. People have lives. We all have our own things we're undoing. Yep. We have to get out the door right now. So yep. I'm sorry you're crying, but move it along, totally. right? Like whatever, uh, whatever uh, it is, yeah. right? Like, yeah. So it's simple, not easy. And I just, yeah, I just love that statement. Mm. But this is so fascinating it's, to think about repression. I don't know. Yeah. And how many of us, again, I think if people are listening to this podcast, you're probably on your own journey of figuring out like what this means for you and where you're at in this, in this path and in this practice, being in practice with repression mm-hmm. <laughs> and auth- and authenticity. Um, but this, this is the work that I feel like brings people together in these more like radical ways, because we're all kind of willing to show up to ourselves and examine who, who, I mean, to say examine who we are sounds so trite, but like in the depths of our human experiences and how our lives reflect who we are, Mm -hmm. examining those things and changing things Mm -hmm. is like really the root of it all. Yeah, I agree. And I think that's like what this podcast is about. Mm -hmm. Like what, you know, as this is the beginning of our journey, but this podcast journey, but I think taking right? The simple concepts of being human and really getting into this mess of, yeah. and what does that actually mean? Or how has it affected our lives? Mm-hmm. And I don't know, I think it's really cool. I think too, something else I was going to say about repression, um, this topic is it seems like the scary thing, mm. like if, if our, I'm thinking about our listeners, right? Like I'm thinking about if I was listening to this podcast And I was trying to maybe figure out like, right, if it's an unconscious thing, right, that's below consciousness. How can we know what's being repressed if the definition of repression or part of the definition of repression is we don't even know it? subconscious, yeah. We don't consciously know it. Yeah. And I'm thinking about that for myself and my Mm -hmm. own life and how I've gotten to the point where I'm at with authenticity. Again, not that I've arrived anywhere, but just where I'm at. And I do think looking back for me, it's always been about it. And it still is like, I can think of a topic right now that I'm like, I'm ignoring. Um, (laughs) Y'all being in practice. (laughs) Avoided. Um, But it's for me, it's always been the thing that's the scariest, Mm. but it's not dangerous to be clear. So, right. Mm. Like the thing that's bringing up the fear or the, um, 
the like my I, well, I know what my tells are for like when I'm like not facing something that needs to be faced right and there's mm -hmm. a lot of fear there's avoidant tactics there's distraction there's like you know the maladaptive quote-unquote and I coping skills and I just say more like things I do in excess to like compensate for the feelings I'm having while yeah. I'm trying to avoid the thing that's scaring me. Mm -hmm. So I guess for our listeners, if you're wondering, like, how do you even begin this process of figuring out if you're wanting to be more authentic and you're thinking what even is down there under that, mm -hmm. that conscious blanket, Yeah, I think you go to the fear. <laughs> that would be my, I don't know. That's been my experience. That'd be my advice. I don't know if you would have like another thought on that or. I feel like as someone who has experienced such severe mental health crises, mm -hmm. going towards the fear is something like I could have never done sure, in sure. those moments, in those times. So for me, I guess I would say like, go towards the regulation. Okay. What you'd say the opposite. Regulatory. So for like in, in the work that I do in the way that I work with myself, with my clients, with my kid is like staying in the window of tolerance is really important. So for me, like mm -hmm. thinking about going towards the fear was, was already pushing me over my window of tolerance. And for those who don't know what the window of tolerance is, that's kind of the place that we can stay where our nervous system and our bodies are regulated, mm -hmm. our somatic um, identifiers are regulated, like our heartbeat stays the same, our breathing stays regulated, those kinds of things. So for me, when I thought, like, when I think about going towards the fear, not now, but before, mm -hmm. it would have been mm -hmm. like instant, like throat closed, sure. panic shallow breath like heart racing like that makes sense ears yeah. ringing <laughs> so i i feel like hmm. we've got to get to the places where we can do that safely to be able to then address what those fears are how they affect our lives and how we can change them mm -hmm. but i think again only like from the way that I, it has been safe for me to do so i had to be able to regulate first that makes sense to do that yeah yeah and i that's i'm glad you said that and that's a definitely valuable and like very legit perspective and way to do it i think i think i think i have had i don't know I, what came to mind was like not an opposite experience of how i've come into authenticity mm -hmm. but i i'm thinking about my gayness like for yeah. instance my queer identity as a little one that didn't know I was queer until like college or even that it came into awareness in college, even though I was experiencing crushes on girls before that, but mm -hmm. I didn't know what they were anyway. So I'm thinking about that, for instance, for me growing up in a very, also very religious, strict home. Um, and I'm thinking about just like little Aaron going, just being really... <laughs> This is so funny. Being really like annoyed with the fear mm. and the and the feelings that would come up with my own version of like whatever I was repressing, like mm -hmm. probably yeah, like facing my queer identity at the time. And yeah, I think that's kind of where like for our listeners that might have a similar like energy about them. I don't know what what part of my chart it's about, but. <laughs> I think I also like, I'm a person that really val, I don't know, like I've been talking to my therapist about this lately, but um, really values freedom. And I mm -hmm. think when I notice the scary feelings, I want to slam into the wall and just stop them. So I just, mm -hmm. so I, I go to avoidance until I can't handle the pressure anymore. Yeah. And then I just face it and go through it. Yeah. So that's my process. So, and I think this is again, this is like going towards authenticity, but at a base level of like where someone can start, exactly. honestly, personality tests, super helpful. Mm, Understanding mm -hmm. your attachment style, super helpful. Understanding your values. your values, understanding your astrology. If that's something you care about, you know, I do. <laughs> we both but like, do. You we do both more. care a lot you about astrology. <laughs> Danny knows more. I use astrology in my work to help yeah. clients mm -hmm. inform, you know, paths forward because mm -hmm. when we understand ourselves, we're able to make more authentic decisions. And, but I think those are like things that we can do. Like, you know, that you run towards the fear. I like mm -hmm. anxious, mm -hmm. anxious attachment style over here, disorganized, anxious over here, which I have anxious attachment, but I 
my, in my anxiety, I avoid the trigger until I can't. So it's just anyway. Mm. But yes, but yeah, it's good so to like, know though. And also, this is this is the thing is like nobody's paths towards exactly. healing That's from depression we or with. into authenticity. Look, th- like as many people as there are on the planet is as many ways as you can do this, which is and why probably more. <laughs> yeah, which is I'm glad that you brought up the regulation thing and that you know it's beautiful that I love this about our partnership that there's you know just as there's space for all of you and your guys's processes out there there's space for ours and yeah now you've at least heard two ways of being authentic and <laughs> that's not very many with compared to how many people are on the earth but you know mm-hmm. still but it's useful. two versions of the of the two sides of the same coin. one of the coins of the authenticity <laughs> repression of, coin yeah um yeah and i think you mentioned earlier like knowing your tells i think that's also mm-hmm. that's like a larger mental health conversation but for totally. for me like we hear you know fight flight freeze those are things we hear a lot but also like fawn also mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. what's the word that i'm thinking of like shutting down um is it not shutting down shutting down know. yeah like it starts with an o i can't think of it at the moment that's oh, okay yeah i don't know um but like understanding that like maybe if we're faced with a fear or if we're faced with a part of ourselves that we're having trouble reconciling or realizes like becomes conscious that that is repression. How do we first react to that? And just noticing that might be a place to start. Yes. Might be a, Being might curious. Be a helpful, exactly. Be mm-hmm. curious about it, which is always easier said than done when I'm like face something with non-judgment. It's like, well, how, but also just start. We can only start where we are and meet ourselves where we're at in any given moment. I like the word explore. My therapist explore gave me that beautiful. word last week and it was really helpful for like four days. And then I was like, back in the, back in the shit. <laughs> Exploring for four days, but that's how it is. It's but like, you just, you can expand a little, more, a little, a little bit, more. a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. There's like three steps forward, 7 million steps back, four steps forward, one step back, 10 million steps forward. Like it's so blah, 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 so fluid. The positive, the positive steps forward too are so impactful. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if there's, is there anything else on that we get through all the authenticity repression? I mean, I feel like we've given folks a, maybe a good little bite-sized taste of what to examine in themselves. Mm -hmm. Like just hearing our stories reflected back to them might be helpful to start just, you know, looking around your life, feeling into what feels like it's serving you. Mm -hmm. How does your life reflect, reflect what you feel like is your most authentic self in this moment. And if not, what are some resources? First question. That's Mm. a really good first question. Should we repeat it? Yeah. I forgot what I said. (laughs) You said something like, I mean, people can rewind, but you said something like asking yourself, are you living, are you living your most authentic life right now? Something like that. That's one of the first questions I'll ask clients is like, do you feel like your life reflects what you believe your values are in this moment? Mm-hmm. And a that's a question. Yeah, it's a beautiful way to, and if, to get us thinking in different ways. And if the answer is no, and it's probably going to be no for most of us most of the time, because for sure. that's a part of being alive, I think, is like figuring the things out. If the answer is no, then things what are some we resources? can do. Yeah. Yes. Well, Tips and tricks time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that that will be always the resource music, but there you go. Therapy integrative coaching Obviously, great integrative options coaching, somatic great work options. i know um, they've helped me they've helped yeah, you absolutely i am a therapist obviously i believe in therapy and um, i am a somatic integrative coach, coach. <laughs> i don't even hire both aaron and i and we'll be a team i feel like also those are the ways in which kind of the 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 somatic buzzword that is happening is because people are realizing that we can talk about things all day long, but talking in circles can only help us so far. That's when the more integrative healing work comes in, like you for plant medicine, me for somatic and emotional Mm -hmm. processing and that deeper work that takes life at all levels because Mm -hmm. we live such a multifaceted existence. We don't just live in our minds. We live in our bodies. We live in the world. We live in our emotions. We live in in our energy, our energy is influenced by everybody around us. Yeah. Um, well said. So that's why I work with all of those aspects because I don't feel like we can disconnect any of them from each other. No, it's, yeah. it's, it's funny. I'm glad you bring up the, I don't know what you said a minute ago about how 
I don't know what you said a minute ago, but it reminded me of we're forgetting my a conversation I just had with a friend, my best friend who was just in town, who just start, I just connected her with a therapist in mm. Colorado where she lives, um, which I love doing. I love connecting my friends to therapists. But That's anyway, great. side note, um, we were just talking about her experience. So I was like, I'm so glad you're doing it. It's her first time having a therapist. Mm -hmm. And she's like, honestly, I just didn't do whatever before. I mean, I'm paraphrasing here, but I didn't do whatever before because I. I thought, what's the difference going to be between talking to a therapist and talking to my friends? And I was like, and then in that moment, I was like, I mean, you're knowing it now, but it's a world of difference. And mm -hmm. she totally agreed. And, you know, and I'm sure I know it's the same, like when you have a coach or someone yeah. that's doing the work that you're, the type of work you're doing and doing so well, that our friends, as well-meaning as they are, when you enter like the spaces that we hold for people. Yeah we are so much more, I don't know. I feel like we've been given the gift of healing in our own ways and, and it's just so much more reflective and deep and, yeah. and focused than our friends can give us. So, I mean, we can get into this at another time, but I think that's a helpful, um, prompt of like, what is the difference between like therapy and ethical coaching, I will say that, than just like talking it out with your friends. And I think the safe container is one. The fact that we don't have anything, like we're not there with an ulterior motive. Like mm -hmm. our job is to hold safe space for people mm -hmm. to do their own reflecting. We are being like, we are mirrors for people. That's exactly um, what I was going to say. To hold safe space, to hold like all of their experience without needing to influence them in ways, except for ways that are like supportive and helpful for them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which our friends and our family as well-meaning as they could be typically have ways that they would quote unquote, like to see us go or like, we're all, There's dealing, bias. Yeah, they're, we're all dealing with our own internalized bias. Absolutely. And that still is a part of us as humums in our practices, but for sure. it's, there's layers removed because of our training. Yes. Yeah, it's also our, our job to yeah, take that Remove off ourselves from the scenario mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. hold that like truly safe space for someone to examine themselves with like through non-judgment. And yeah, so that's, I think, a good difference for people to understand who maybe are newer to mm -hmm. that work. Totally. Um, okay. Back to resources. Ba -do -ba -do -ba -do. Okay. There's, this, there's right. the sound again. Journaling. <laughs> Journaling's been very um useful in my life yeah i know you're you've talked about that too journaling is yeah. a great way to learn yourself right that's what i was thinking when mm -hmm. we put this on there um a fun journaling exercise i will recommend this is especially helpful if like me i like you have early childhood experiences that maybe you have repressed or disconnected from is journaling with your non-dominant hand is Ooh, really I've heard interesting of this. yeah because it can often connect you with a part of your brain or even your body and, you know, be prepared to hold space for yourself if, if emotions do come through. Um, but it can really trigger you into, I say trigger, that's the wrong word. Well, put I you think in, it could, put you it in could, touch. it's a trigger, it's right? A trigger. It's, yeah, a, know, it's not a negative word. trigger though, right? right. Like it, flip the switch. Exactly. It can put you in touch with a part of yourself that might need to be listened to, that might need to be heard. And maybe through that practice, you can understand like, something deep inside of you that's like maybe has been repressed or covered up that is authentic. That's a good one. That's it's a good really, prompt. it's really beautiful. I love that. Highly recommend. I'm going to try that today. Yeah. It's fun. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we got books. We um, got some books. You put down, these are actually all from Danny, but the artist's way. I, I, oh, okay. Yep. Do you want to, do you want a little blurbs? I'll blurb. Okay. Okay. First. Yeah. The artist's way by Julia Cameron is a really beautiful, like, more extensive process. It's not necessarily a book you read. It's a book you work. It's a workbook. That's what it mm -hmm, is. Mm -hmm. um, I did it for the first time about 13 years ago and have done it three times, I wow. think, That's cool. um, all the way through. So it's like a few months process for me, the way that I move through it. Um, anyways, it's a really beautiful practice just to kind of like, if it's your first time being like, what about myself? Am I holding on to that's no longer serving? It's a really beautiful and gentle way to explore that in, yeah. in a still very thorough way. Yeah, I'm really um, intrigued. Personally. Yeah. Aaron and I were also talking before recording about the fact that we can't really disentangle like authenticity and repression from systemic oppression. 
from the ways in which we move through the world in like intersectionally marginalized identities as queer folks, mm -hmm. as non-binary folks, we're white, but like, you know, we, there's intersectionality. There's intersectionality. Yes, because we have positions of power and privilege and not. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. Crediting Kimberly Crenshaw for intersectionality. But anyways, thinking from it, from that perspective, um, My Grandmother's Hands by the trauma psychologist Resmund Menachem um, is one of my like seminal texts because it's about somatic healing um, through trauma based on like his perspective as like a black trauma therapist mm. um, cool. and intergenerational trauma and how all of that. those things influence how we repress our trauma. But also then he has amazing tools in that book to reconnect safely with ourselves, our nervous systems, who we are, and like yeah. also being able to examine the world in those ways. I love and, it. Like, not letting any of that slide in this work that we show up for. Um, I got some things to read guys. Yeah. I have read this one, though. Okay, you introduce it then. Okay. Adult children of emotionally immature parents. Uh, we don't have who it's by, but it'll be on the website. Um, yes. Yeah, this is, I mean, I think it's just a good starting point, like we were talking about, too, before recording, for getting back into, sometimes it is helpful to go back mm -hmm. to see, like, if you resonate with that title, you're going to know it, you're going to feel it, Yeah. that when we can go back and see those things that shaped us, right? We were talking yeah. about that from the beginning, like the conditioning that we all get to tap into that child self that wasn't seen, that started repressing, that built the protectors. Yep. And then I can't, are there tools in this? I don't know that I actually. Are there tools? I think it's just more, well, if there aren't, you know, it is. There are in the, I feel like there are, I can't remember actually specifically. I've read it a couple of times now and I can't remember. I'm so sorry. But, okay. we, we but will... either way, a good thought it's going to get you thinking about yourself. Also encourage, especially parents, to read it from the perspective first or both of like how we were raised, but then also how we are parenting and mm -hmm. the ways in which we can yeah. identify how we are still emotionally immature in the ways that we parent. And the fact that we get the gift of being able to actively change those things in our parenting as we move along for the betterment of our ourselves and our kids. Totally. So that's a cool one too. Love it. That is cool. That's a good perspective. Yeah. All right. And then last we have hitting up our website. Yes. Yeah, so we're going to have some tips on there. Our website. Um, we don't have a URL for you yet because we're recording this before we've got it, but it'll be in the show notes. Um, we'll have a full, a, a more uh, representative list of resources mm -hmm. with links and things like that on our website. Um, yeah. And you can also find the transcriptions for all of our episodes on the website as well for those folks who are hard of hearing. Um, Indeed. So, yeah. Or if you just want to read and have any sort all of, of the input needs. Yeah. Whatever. All of the input. Um, okay. Cool. I feel like we covered this pretty thoroughly. Yeah. I've been, it was really nice to hear from you. I appreciate you sharing so vulnerably. And yeah. It's We're going to speciality. Keep... <laughs> I think this was a great one to start with being in practice. Like authenticity is a great way of being. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thank you for being here for exploring, um, repression and authenticity with us. Yeah. It's been a fun journey. Not a fun, I mean, well, has it been fun? <laughs> I think it's been good. Next up, we got relationships. Yeah. We actually, yeah, we'll see what, what comes of that next week, but that's what we're going to be discussing on the next episode. <laughs> Hope you'll join us. I, and this is going to be a good one because I feel like we're going to be exploring relationships from so many different perspectives, queer relationships, straight relationships, monogamous relationships, non-monogamous relationships. We're going to get into it. We're going to get into it, y'all. Yeah. Um, we're going to get into relationship anarchy. We're going to get into poly intimacy. We're going to get into so many ways that we hold relationship with people. So it's going to be big. It's going to be a big one. And I'm sure we'll be sharing more of ourselves and also, you know, the doo -ba -doo -ba -doo trip oh, tips gosh. and tricks. <laughs> all right. So yes. join us uh, next all time. The all the gems. sound effects. Uh, join us next time on Being in Practice. See you then. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.